Now on your screen is Steve Silverman, who is the founder and executive director of a group called Flex Your Rights. Mr. Silverman, what is that group? Flex Your Rights is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to educate people about how to assert their constitutional rights during police encounters, and we offer practical information about what to say and what to do uh, to, in order to bring about the best outcomes possible in a very stressful situation. What motivated you to found a group like that? Well, you know, the thing is, most people during a police encounter will do one of two things that I found. And I found this from my you know, early activism work, um, that people will often either capitulate in every single way and say, sure, officer, go ahead and take a look. I don't mind. Or on the other end of the spectrum, they'll get angry and antagonistic and frustrated and try to take it out on the police officer, which can lead to absolutely terrible outcomes. What I've tried to do is try to find that middle ground where you can confidently and calmly assert your constitutional rights uh, in an assertive way that actually can protect your constitutional rights. But what are some of our constitutional rights that we might not be aware of? Well, probably the most common one that I've found is that most folks have, uh, don't have a clear understanding of, for example, the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. And this is very important during a, a traffic stop. Traffic stops represent about 52% of all citizen police encounters. And during a traffic stop, everything might seem to go well. You might be getting pulled over for any number of reasons under the sun, and you get either a warning or a citation or even a ticket. You, of course, should never try to talk your way out of a ticket or get angry about uh, a ticket and always be calm and cool. But oftentimes, the police will sort of pull a, a Steve Jobs and they'll say, well, wait, there's one more thing. We've had a lot of uh, gun runners going up and down this highway and or, you know, they'll say something like, we're just, we're looking out for terrorists. You're not a terrorist, are you? You don't have any guns or bombs in the trunk. And 90% of the time, citizens will say, oh, no, officer, sure, go ahead and search. And oftentimes, if it's a, you know, young people particularly, they'll say something like, we're not looking for just a little bit of marijuana. Like I said, we're looking for guns and bombs. In that situation, people will say, sure, officer, go ahead. And anything the police officer finds will be likely used against them, and they'll find themselves getting arrested. And then the officer, you know, the citizen will say, but officer, I thought you said you were just looking for guns and bombs. You could tell that to the judge, but you're under arrest. And so in such situations, whether or not you have anything on you, it's very important to say, officer, I know you're just doing your job, but I do not consent to any searches. And what happens at that point? Is that a reasonable suspicion if well, you do not consent? No, that's a, that's, a, that's a myth. And oftentimes police officers will try to trick citizens into thinking that their refusal is actually evidence of a search. Police need to have what's called probable cause which is actual evidence that a crime is, is taking place. That could include something that they see, or, or actually the smell of marijuana itself could be probable cause. So that's certainly one good reason uh, for young people to understand that. Um, but if they, if they say, do you mind if I take a look, and you say no, that cannot be used against you in court. The next thing that's likely to happen also is it's very important to understand that you want to try to withdraw yourself from the encounter. People often wait for a police officer to give them permission to go. So a very smart thing to say is, officer, again, I know you're just doing your job, but am I free to go now? And police have to actually have a reason to, they need reasonable suspicion, which is a lower standard than probable cause, to detain you, to investigate you, because they have reason to believe you might be involved in a crime. But they do have a certain window which they can legally detain you. So the right question to ask in that situation is, officer, Am I free to go? Well, how do you define, and we're putting the numbers up on the screen if you'd like to talk uh, with Steve Silverman of Flex Your Rights about civil liberties and police conduct. Uh, you can see the numbers there on the screen, but I want to point out that our fourth line is set aside for law enforcement officials. And there's the number, 202-585-3883. We'd like to get your point of view, uh, certainly, as well. Uh, but. Can't a policeman, and maybe I'm being a little overly suspicious here, but can a policeman say, oh, I had reasonable cause to stop this person. I thought maybe they, they looked drunk or, you know, they were rude to me. Being, well, being rude in and of itself isn't, isn't necessarily, wouldn't constitute reasonable suspicion. Certainly, it's not a good idea to try to escalate the encounter. But certainly, you know, looking and appearing drunk is, is reasonable suspicion to detain someone and ask them further questions. 
But in so many of the situations that we were talking about, what police are doing is sort of they're fishing for something. And sort of the, the, the loophole to the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures that police are able to drive a Mack truck through is simply asking, do you mind if I take a look? And if citizens consent, the search is legal. So essentially, there's, no, there's nothing you can do on that back end when you are in court or you have a lawyer. If you've consented to the search, for example, you've really put yourself at any disadvantage. And again, I would argue that citizens, whether or not you think you have anything to hide, you have every right to say, officer, I don't consent to searches. I believe in the Fourth Amendment, and I'd like to be on my way. Many times people think they do not have anything to hide whatsoever. They consent to a search, and something is found there that may have been left there by a friend, a family member, or even a previous car owner. I've heard ridiculous stories of that nature. And so in those situations, when you have the right to assert your constitutional rights, you should consider doing it. You, of course, have every right to say, sure, go ahead. It's up to you. But at least you understand you know, that it's a choice that you have, whether to consent or not. Steve Silverman, a lot of talk now about body cams uh, on policemen. We've got the dash cams. Plus, can, when it comes to a citizen, can a citizen record a policeman stop? Yes, yes, yes. It's, I, I think, for one thing, as a policy, uh, I think body cams on police is a fantastic idea. It, it's good for police and it's good for citizens. It puts everybody on their best behavior. As far as citizens are concerned, citizens have the First Amendment right to openly record the police everywhere. There's a lot of confusion about this. A lot of citizens um, and police officers are confused about this. You're still seeing videos of police officers arresting citizens for recording the police. But this is actually in violation of the law. Um, there are about 12 states in the, in the nation that have what are called all party consent rules. And this actually causes some confusion because citizen, because police think that, oh, wait, you're violating my privacy. You can't film me. But actually, the courts in those states have ruled that this doesn't apply to police officers on duty, that citizens have First Amendment right to openly record the police, and they, and, and they should do that. And they can use lots of technology and their smartphone in particular uh, to do that. And you say openly record. Exactly. You can't just flip on your cell phone video recorder. Right. I emphasize openly because um, the courts have ruled that if you do it surreptitiously, you could run afoul of these um, all-party consent laws. I mean, they're essentially uh, intended to prevent people from surreptitiously recording conversations that are presumed to be um, private. Uh, and so you want to, when you record the police, you want to act like a reporter because in a sense you are a reporter. You don't need to have um, a license to report the police um, or to be a reporter in general. And you have every right uh, to record them. You don't want to do it like a spy. Final question before we go to calls, and by the way, our fourth line is set aside for law enforcement, 202-585-3883 is the number for you to dial in and get your opinion. Uh, situations in Ferguson where the citizens were recording the police in the street during some of the riots and some of the situations there, is that allowed? Can you videotape a police confrontation? Abs yes, you, you can. And, and you know, as far as the, you know, my, the rules for recording the police that I have. I mean, the first one is know the law. And as I, as I you know, explained, you always have the right to openly record the police. Uh, another rule could be if the police order you to step back, for example, it's OK to do that. I think it's OK to have some flexibility because, for example, you don't want to be obstructing the officer. Officers will sometimes take advantage of this little bit and say, keep stepping back, keep stepping back. And it's up to you to decide whether you want to keep recording or if you think you're too far out of view. It's also important to note that even though it's perfectly legal to record police, when you do record the police, you should be prepared to be arrested. And that's a little bit, it doesn't really make sense. It's a little bit confusing because like I said, the police are often confused about this law. And police officers do have a lot of discretion to make arrests. So it's up to you to decide whether you're willing to risk that in order to capture what I would argue would be police misconduct. And if you use an app like, for example, Bamboozer, B-A-M-B-U-S-E-R. I don't work for Bamboozer. But right now, Bamboozer is the best live streaming 
recording app. And if you put it on, actually, I didn't bring my phone because your producer said, do not bring in your phone because it could ring, and I appreciate that. Uh, but what you can do, if you have a passcode on your phone, which I highly recommend, everyone keep a passcode protection on their phone. Supreme Court recently ruled that citizens need, uh, that police rather, need to have a warrant in order to search citizens' phone. Fantastic ruling. But in the meantime, it's still a good idea to keep a passcode protection on your phone because sometimes police are the last to get the memo when it comes to Supreme Court rulings. So when you use Bamboozer, for example, or any live streaming app, and you're recording the police, the advantage of Bamboozer is if the police officers unlawfully snatch your phone, confiscate it, or smash it to bits, everything that you've recorded up until that point will be saved off-site, and you can later access that video. And the other benefit of keeping the passcode protection on your phone, too, is even if they snatch your phone and you hit the sleep button on your phone while using a live streaming app like Bamboozer, and police take that, they won't be able to delete your video. So as far as technology is concerned, I, would, I consider that to be the best practice. Make sure you have a passcode on your phone and use a live streaming video app uh, like Bamboozer in order to preserve your video because if you have video evidence of police violating your constitutional rights, you are going to be in a much stronger position than if it's simply your word against theirs. Let's take some calls. We're going to begin with Angus in Greensboro, North Carolina. Angus? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, I had the pleasure of watching uh, this guy's show yesterday on Washington Journal. And you had a uh, detective on there, Fogg, uh, with the marshal's office. And one of the comments that he made that I thought was very important was that the, 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 the probable cause thing is a catch-all phrase that the police use to stop anyone they want to. In other words, the probable cause that I stop you is because forever. And that is something that has not been, to some extent, contested or dealt with in, in law enforcement. Because when you go to court, actually, the, the, the victim, or not the victim, but the, the culprit has three people that he has to fight against, and that is the, the, the DA, the police, and the judge. In other words, he has to convince three organizations and three superior uh, uh, elements of his innocence. And if you've got the, the DA on the, behind the police and the judge that is also back in the police, then you're almost at a... You had a thorough disadvantage just by the fact that you did. All right, we got the point, Mr. Silverman. Right. I mean, the thing with our information is, uh, with flex rates, it focuses much more on the front end of things, is what to do during that police encounter, the things that you have the power to say or do that can affect how things then play out on the back end. And at this point, you're going to have a criminal defense lawyer as your advocate, and they're going to be essentially doing surgery. Um, you know, with your case. And so what happens there is going to depend in very much, not entirely, but very much on the things that you do and say. And so oftentimes police, when it comes to probable cause, will try to trick you into thinking that they have the right to search you, for example. But don't assume whether or not they have probable cause. That's not really for you to decide. That'll ultimately be uh, for the judge uh, to decide. At that point, the best move is to simply say, Officer, I know you're just doing your job, but I can't let you in my home without a warrant. Officer, I know you're just doing your job, but I can't let you search me or my car. I don't consent to any searches. And that will be your best protection. And criminal defense lawyers who review our work always say the same thing, that most of their clients actually fail to assert their constitutional right to refuse searches, which makes their job a lot more difficult in court. Bob is calling in from Margaretville, New York. Bob, you're on the air. Yeah, I'm listening to Mr. Silverman here. And, uh, you know, I live in a small town upstate New York, and um, all the time we're getting up here is, well, we pulled you over for uh, a license plate light, perhaps, that was out. It really wasn't out, all right? You're not allowed to leave the vehicle. State police are having a problem with the courts. The courts apparently aren't prosecuting enough people to keep the state police happy. So one mile over the speed limit, this small rural town, you're it. 
Now they pull you over. Now they ask for probable. When can we search your car? You ask why? Well, probable cause. You look like somebody who may have committed a crime somewhere else in the area. Bob, have you so had that personal really experience? No, I haven't. I know many, many, many people who have, though. All and right. I, I Let's get a response so. from our guest. Absolutely, Bob. You know, the, the fact is, oftentimes, policing in the United States is entrepreneurial. And, you know, in a lot of these small towns, police officers see people, you know, traveling up and down, you know, a, a highway there as, as a revenue generator and oftentimes use what are called pretexts to stop people. Police officers have a lot of discretion to pull a car over for any reason under the sun. And this is just something that motorists have to uh, appreciate. And so when you're in that situation, even if you think that essentially that you are being, perhaps you are being profiled in some way, the fact is you don't always know what is in the heart and mind of the police officer and what's going on you know, in, uh, you know, with their culture and the, at their police department. At that situation, the best thing to do is to always remain calm and courteous and be prepared to assert your constitutional rights. Don't consent to any searches. If you start being interrogated, say, officer, I really don't want to answer any more questions. Am I free to go? And if something happens and you do wind up getting arrested, the best thing to say at that point is nothing, except I have nothing to say until I speak with my lawyer. And then you keep your mouth shut until that happens. William is calling in from Greenbelt, Maryland, here in the Washington area, and he is in law enforcement. William, what's your, what kind of law enforcement do you do? Uh, county. County police. Okay. You've been listening to our conversation this morning. What are your thoughts? Well, my question is, I'd like their guests to uh, speak on the fact that driving is a commercial term and that what, uh, what, what they're actually doing is... Uh, they're saying that you are making money on the roadways. So they're enforcing commercial laws. Thank you very much. Did you follow that? Not really. Um, well, I will say this, um, that uh, I presume the, op the officer is uh, from PG County Police Department. PG County Police Department um, is, has notoriously been one of the most corrupt police departments in the country, actually, when it comes to um, transparency um, in terms of covering up incidents of police abuse. For example, there was a horrible situation a few years ago where um, a College Park um, student was celebrating after the University of Maryland won um, a basketball game against Duke. And uh, what happened was the, the, the young man was skipping along and a police officer beat, severely beat the young man. Now, it didn't really end there because, well, at first, of course, the police, uh, the PG County Police Department claimed that the young man assaulted uh, the police first, and they charged him with, with numerous uh, violations. And later, the closed circuit camera revealed that, in fact, the police officer was the one who attacked the young man. Um, moreover, uh, apparently, it was a um, uh, a wife of a, of a PG County police officer that was handling uh, those cameras and actually was actively covering up the release of those cameras and none of you know, the police officer, the wife, uh, were ever held accountable. And this is something that, that seems to happen repeatedly uh, within the PG County Police Department. Prince George's County. Prince George's sorry County. Sorry William yes. isn't uh, with us anymore, otherwise we'd get a response from him on that. Ed in Wild Rose, Wisconsin. And by the way, that student sued, didn't he? And he won a... The a, student sued and he, he, he won. And interestingly enough, the, the police officer was never, was never charged. I believe that the judge in that case actually was once married to a PG County police officer and, and tossed the charges inexplicably. And so there, there has not been justice uh, in that, I would argue, but this seems to be something that uh, is a habit uh, among Prince George's County uh, police and, and, and prosecutors. Wild Rose, Wisconsin, Democrat, Ed. Good morning. Hi. Um, I, I have a, uh, a minor, um, well, I guess it's a felony, but it's a uh, selling pot charge from 20 years ago. 
And uh, I got a letter yesterday in the mail stating that I had to submit to a DNA test, even though I've I've had not even a traffic ticket in 20 years, and I had no record before then. Um, and I believe my crime was before the Supreme Court um, said that uh, DNA databases were okay. Is this legal, or is the state of Wisconsin just allowed to go back retroactively and get everybody that's ever been convicted of a crime and have them come in for DNA? To, to be honest, Ed, I, I, I don't know the answer to your specific question, but and I oftentimes don't know the answer to specific legal questions like that, but that is a question where my response would be, talk to a lawyer before you do anything. Flex your rights. Ten rules for dealing with the police. Number one, always be calm and cool. You have the right, right to remain silent. You have the right to refuse searches. Don't get tricked into waiving your rights. Determine if you're free to go. Don't do anything illegal. Don't run. Never touch a policeman. Report misconduct. Be a good witness. And you don't have to let them in your house. And we have this tweet from VA Texan saying, why is the Washington Journal having this tips for criminals segment? Are we giving tips for criminals here? The information we teach is basic constitutional rights. Now, the, this information, interestingly enough, is the same thing that lawyers and police officers teach their own children. Well, Flex Your Rights, we believe that this information should be available to everybody. Moreover, I think that everybody should be prepared to assert their constitutional rights regardless of whether they are or think they're doing anything illegal, because otherwise we have a society where everyone is presumed guilty and police can stop anyone for any reason under the sun, can go into anybody's home in order to search them because they might have a hunch uh, that they're involved in something illegal. This is exactly what the founders uh, fought a revolution to stop. Dave is in Alexandria, Minnesota, independent line. Dave, you're on the air. Yes. Uh, my experience was that I uh, was on a steep hill between Long Prairie, Minnesota, and Little Falls, Minnesota, and I saw uh, a bunch of uh, cattle, uh, farmers' cattle had gone across the road. Well, I went down and I saw a highway cop ahead of me about a half a mile in the down the hill, and he had a somebody pulled over there. Well, I went down there and I parked at quite a distance ahead of him because I didn't want him to get spooked by somebody else coming uh, to talk to him. So uh, then I started walking toward him. And before I even got toward him, he had a taser on me and threatened to use it on me. Well, I mean, I had, not, had done nothing except wanting to tell him about these cattle that were loose and uh, crossing the road. So anyway, what happened is that, uh, and, it, and I got heart problems, I, he could have uh, killed me with that taser. But uh, anyway, uh, then I uh, reported it later to his uh, superior, and his superior just blew it off. His superior in St. Cloud, Minnesota, just blew it off. And I thought, you know, here they are pulling a taser on you. You hadn't done a damn thing. That gave me the impression that I'm never going to stop and tell a cop about anything anymore. There's no doubt about it. I mean, a, 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 a bad police encounter can have these other, other incidental effects, is that people are, are going to be less likely um, to trust the police. Um, and I think it's a good thing that you reported uh, the incident, even though it seems like you didn't get any redress or, or even apology. I think it's still worth reporting uh, common incidents of police misconduct like that, because the fact of the matter is very few people do, and most people are simply afraid to report uh, police misconduct. So, Dave, I really I, I applaud you for, for having the bravery to at least stand up uh, for yourself and, 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 and report that uh, to the local police department, because even if it didn't seem like uh, you got any redress from that, it's possible that that officer may have been chewed out by his superior officer. I don't know, but it's still something that's worth doing. Steve Silverman, do we live in more of a police state than it used to be, or do we live in a police state? I don't think we. I don't think there are an increased number of police incidents. What we certainly do have is an increased number of police, of bad police behavior that is caught on video and disseminated through YouTube. And this is a very positive thing. So it sometimes seems like, oh my God, the police are out of control, or we're living in a police state. But I really think that 
it, I, I, I don't think the statistics bear out that there's an increasing number of incidents, but rather incidents that would have been swept under the rug, that would have been um, a story between the citizen and the police officer, where in court, the courts have generally taken the side of the police officer in such situations, but now that they're caught on video, I mean, the fact is, video brings us closer, you know, it reveals the truth, and the truth can help bring us closer to, to justice. Wild and Wonderful tweets in, and I believe she's a lawyer, and I, she'll let us know if I'm telling it wrong. Uh, no need to get wordy with a police officer. The answer is, as soon as you present me with a search warrant. I mean, in, in your home, yes. I think in the home, police cannot enter your home without a search warrant, unless, of course, you open the door and say, sure, go ahead and come on in. Oftentimes, the police won't say, do you mind if we take a look inside? Now, we won't come in unless, you know, without a search warrant, unless you give us consent. It sounds a lot more like a command. Go ahead and let me in. You know, you don't mind if I take a look inside? And they might even sort of maybe even for, push their way in a little bit. Um, in, in your home, the home is your castle, and the Supreme Court has essentially ruled as such. The police, with very few rare um, uh, exemptions, can enter your home without a warrant. So if police are trying to knock on your door and asking to come on in to take a look around, Off officers, I cannot let you inside without a warrant and keep that door locked. Howie, Philadelphia, Republican. You're on with Steve Silverman of Flex Your Rights. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. And um, Mr. Silverman, I, uh, I appreciate your stance on people power. We seem to be real lenient on the Supreme Court. You see how all these politicians, they freaking hate our guts. And the thing is, is that uh, everybody has all these ideas, but nobody wants to get rid of FDR and Bill Clinton's war on crime. We don't want to get rid of war on drugs. The, the situation is just it's out of control. What are we going to do about this? And uh, one last thing, please vote for um, Governor Corbett. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that the, the war on drugs fuels so many of these sorts of, of police encounters where police are, are searching uh, you know, for small amounts of drugs and that they have, they have tangible benefits um, to them and the, themselves and their departments to, to make as many arrests, to show the numbers. And so there's no doubt about that the war on drugs fuels so much of these violations of people's basic rights. And nowhere is this more present than in New York City where, with their, with their uh, stop and frisk program where you have you have a whole generation of young black and brown men who are growing up feeling that it is basically a matter of course that police officers will stop them for little or no reason and pat them down and hassle and humiliate them and, and have them go on their way. And in nine out of ten situations, they find absolutely nothing on them. Um, and so that's a huge problem, and that is so much fueled by uh, the war on drugs and war on drugs policing, with, which creates these perverse incentives for police departments to stop and frisk uh, so many people. Amy tweets in that the tips for criminals comment guy on Twitter who assumes citizens are criminals is the precise reason we all need to know our rights. Tracy in Cleveland, Ohio, Democrat. Hi, I'm calling regarding um, the police department and there are a, that people will get pulled over and it will, they'll say that they were pulled over for racial profiling. Now, a lot of times um, there's a, a reason that our police officers have pulled them over, whether they find someone with an active warrant or their suspended license, whatever the problem may be. Um, but in our city, um, I was a councilwoman here for 13 years, and I have found um, I would get upset because we wouldn't sue these people. We'd let them sue us, but we wouldn't defend ourselves or the police officer who puts himself every day in the line of um, duty where he could get killed because it was cheaper for us to pay somebody off than it was for um, this to go before our insurance company to pay whatever it would cost. And our city was in financial um, problems at the time and they said well maybe we'll do it when we come out well we are now out and we are still not um letting these people um defend we're not allowed to defend ourselves against these people or their allegations based on it's cheaper just to pay it than it is to go through the court system um right, and i am 
We got the point, Tracy. Thank Tracy, you. Tracy, I think you're putting the blame on the wrong place. And I understand, you know, if you're running a city, you're looking at you're looking at your dollars, and you don't want them spent inappropriately. But I think it's wrong to blame citizens who are able to successfully sue the police. It's very, very challenging to sue the police and win for civil rights violations. So when when city officials are upset about the, the dollar uh, amounts of the checks that they have to cut to citizens who have their rights violated, the place they need to look is at the police department and look at changing their practices and their culture. And it could often start with firing uh, the police chief at the top who is allowing this, but even more importantly, oftentimes police chiefs who try to implement um, more law-based uh, uh, policing are often the ones who wind up uh, at a disadvantage because the police unions have so much power in terms of um, what police chiefs can do, which includes most oftentimes they can't even fire police officers who clearly are violating citizens' constitutional rights. So like I said, uh, the place you want to put the blame is on the police department and their practices because if police departments are respecting citizens' constitutional rights. Uh, you won't have to be cutting these checks to citizens who have their rights violated. Victor is calling in from Meridian, Mississippi, and it says that uh, you are retired law enforcement. Victor, from what are you retired? I'm retired from the Pasco Stand Police Department. Okay. Uh, I was a lieutenant. I was over. I was chief of patrol. I was over patrol operations and training. Uh, you want to talk about corruption? Uh, the guy that's chief of police right now. When I got hired January 15, 1975, he got hired about nine months later. He went through the police academy while he was a convicted felon. It served time in Louisiana for burglary. Uh, and then corruption from then on. It was just, I was a very aggressive officer. I did things by the book. And this guy would be trying to get these drug addicts and drug users off the charges. And uh, so, Victor, a, Victor, if you've listened to our conversation this morning, uh, what do you think about Steve Silverman's group, Flex Your Rights? Do you, are, are, is he fair to the, uh, the police side of this view when it I comes to... I think he is. Um, I, was, I always went by the book. They even had a mayor that tried to get rid of me. Uh, he, he, voted, he, he won by a landslide just because... They'd say uh, he would get the people convinced that it, he promised to get rid of me. And I went by the book, but he was constantly trying to find some reason. If somebody filed some little complaint because they felt like they were mis, uh, mistreated, uh, he'd go after me with vengeance. And um, Victor, uh, he'd never it win. But, uh, Victor, it, is it easy for a policeman, in your view, to use the reasonable cause or the reasonable suspicion uh, standard to perhaps search a car, perhaps stop somebody? Well, what I used to do is uh, if I smelled marijuana coming from the vehicle, that's probably cause to search without a search warrant. I, I would uh, tell tell the guy what he's done wrong. But a lot of times I'd see paper rollers on the uh, dash or uh, um, some vegetable-like substance. Like back in 79, I stopped two lawyers. And I thought I smelled marijuana, but it wasn't burning. Okay. We lost him. Oh, uh, Is that the end of that? No, I, I could tell you, I had a lot of sergeants. I had one sergeant, one take over our police explorers. And then we had like about five boys, 33 girls, wanting to be cops one day. And uh, he wanted to take over. He ended up uh, promising these boys, if they gave him sex, that uh, uh, he promised them a job. Well, he got caught up with, and then he lost his job. He got right. fired. And then That's he... Victor in Meridian, Mississippi, retired law enforcement. Anything you'd like no, to Vic... respond to there, Mr. Silverman? Absolutely, Victor. You know, the, the, there's an important place for, for whistleblowers in police departments, and, and oftentimes uh, police officers who, who do blow the whistle are the ones who can speak the best about the fear of retaliation. 
uh, from their fellow police officers. So I appreciate you standing up for people's rights within the department. That being said, uh, all of our information that we, we do put out is vetted by police officers. In fact, uh, uh, former uh, Major Neil Franklin from the Baltimore Police Department, himself actually a whistleblower uh, within the department, uh, was an on-set consultant to make sure that all of the police in the scenes did everything uh, appropriate. Um, the uh, chief of police of Columbia, Missouri, uh, Chief Burton, actually uses 10 rules for dealing with police as part of community outreach to educate citizens about their constitutional rights, but because he believes that police who actually do follow the Constitution do the best policing. And that gets down to the question or concern that a lot of people who purport to speak on behalf of, of police departments claim that, you know, the, the Constitution in many ways is like a, is a loophole and, and, you know, people are always falling back on their constitutional rights. The founders crafted the Bill of Rights not to create loopholes, but rather to create a template for good policing. The Fourth Amendment requires evidence in order to investigate. That is a template for good police procedure and behavior. Steve Silverman was a campus coordinator for StopTheDrugWar.org, and he's worked as an intern at Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Have you been arrested? I have not been arrested. Um, I've been lucky. I had a near miss. Uh, one of th This happened when I was uh, at college at University of Maryland. I got an early morning phone call from a friend of mine, my friend Steve, a different Steve, actually. Um, he said, you got to come see my dorm. You got to see what you got to come here. And his voice was definitely very concerned. So I trudged through the, the snow, and and he opened the door. And his, he and his roommate revealed their room had been tossed. I mean, normally they didn't keep the tidiest dorm room, but every drawer that could be pulled off was turned over, and someone had shredded their mattresses. It looked like someone was searching for a microfilm or something like that. It turned out the night before. They got a knock on the door, and it was the police. They had smelled marijuana, and sure enough, uh, Steve and his roommate consented to the search. They admitted everything, and, and the police found a little pipe with a little bit of marijuana residue. The thing after that was I was more angry about this incident than, than even my friend was, and that sort of was the spark that kind of led me down to learn a little bit more about police procedures and, 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 and helped me reveal that very few people understood the most basic rules of police procedure and one that oftentimes doing things that put them at a terrible disadvantage. You've released several videos. You've got a, a DVD here we want to show you, but on YouTube as well, a lot of videos. Right. Um, our two videos, our, our original one was called Busted, the, the Citizen's Guide to Surviving Police Encounter. We had uh, former uh, longtime executive director Ira Glasser as our star narrator in that. We released 10 rules for dealing with police in 2009. Ten Rules is sort of the newer, it's, it's much more polished, it's maybe a little bit more mature, probably the more appropriate one to show in, in high schools, for example. Uh, but both videos are available on YouTube. We've cut them up into a bunch of clips. Each, both of them are 40 minutes each, so we've got dozens and dozens of clips answering specific questions um, on our YouTube channel at YouTube slash FlexYourRights.org. We've gotten about uh, 35, 36 million views uh, since we've released those. Damon is in Prospect, Kentucky, on our Republican line. Damon, you're on the Washington Journal with Steve Silverman. Good morning. I'm really enjoying this segment. And uh, the comment I'd like to get from your guest is about uh, what I consider one of the most blatant uh, disregard for citizens' rights is, uh, I guess, it falls under the guise of what they call civil forfeiture, where people, uh, law-abiding citizens, are driving down the road with cash in their pocket and the police are pulling them over, and, and I guess with no uh, proof of anything, just saying, I think that's drug money, so I'm taking it. And it is literally highway robbery, in my opinion, and uh, apparently uh, what rights does the citizen have in that? The last time I checked, carrying cash is not illegal, and these people are... Uh, directly benefiting from that. If that money was going to go to charity or something, they had no ulterior motive, it might be more palatable, but the police departments that are taking this money are directly benefiting it from that so they can buy themselves new vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. There was a guy that's well-documented cases of this, and somebody needs to be standing on a mountaintop ringing a bell. Uh, I find this extremely disturbing, and the police departments know that it's so prohibitively expensive and convoluted process to get your money back. You're essentially guilty until proven innocent that 
a lot of people just, it's easier to walk away and forfeit the money, and the police departments know this. And I would really like a law enforcement officer to call in and comment on this and uh, uh, defend this. It's, it's, it's indefensible, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, there was uh, on one of the news shows a guy. You know what, Damon? Was, We're running a little tight on time, so we're going to leave your comment there and have Mr. Silver respond to that. I think Damon that. did just a perfect job of describing uh, the, the problems uh, with, the, with asset forfeiture and how, again, this is part of entrepreneurial policing where police are pulling people over and they're asking, oh, do you have any cash uh, in your car? Uh, and if you're ever in that situation, again, a good idea to say, officer, I know you're just doing your job, but I really don't want to answer any questions. Am I free to go? Because if you admit to having cash in your car, it's possible they might go ahead and search you and confiscate that cash. And it's a, it's a, it's a Kafka-esque process of trying to get your money back that is essentially that has been stolen from you because technically the, the, the crime is against the money itself. It's a very strange system, and it's nearly impossible for citizens to get their money back because usually the amount it would cost in court fees and lawyers in order to get this money back is so prohibitively expensive that they walk away. Meanwhile, police departments are using this uh, to get you know, military equipment and the sort of toys that, that they want to have that they otherwise wouldn't be able to justify uh, paying for based on the budgets that they have. You probably saw this, this uh, late summer Sunil Dutta is a uh, policeman and a professor of homeland security at Colorado Tech and he's an LA or was an LA um, police officer for 17 years. Mm -hmm. The t title of this editorial or article, I'm a cop, if you don't want to get hurt, don't challenge me. Working the street, he writes, I can't even count how many times I withstood Curses, screaming tantrums, aggressive and menacing encroachments on my safety zone, and outright challenges to my authority. In the vast majority of such encounters, I was able to peacefully resolve the situation without using force. I, I thought that was a very interesting article. In fact, he even goes on to sort of provide sort of a flex your rights template where he says you have the right to refuse searches, and on, which is sort of an interesting juxtaposition because he sort of opens up with, do whatever I say. And so it, it seems to be a little bit of a contradiction. I thought the, his, his op-ed was a little bit um, on the end of kind of blaming the victim. I mean, I, I just... I don't begrudge people who feel upset uh, at the point of a police encounter and get a little bit upset. And I don't think that even talking back to a police officer in any way or voicing discontent with the situation should ever be used to justify any sort of uh, physical force uh, against a citizen unless the officer actually feels that uh, the citizen is, is, is threatening to them. Wallace is calling from Dallas, Texas, retired law enforcement. Wallace, what, from what are you retired? Uh, I retired in 1996. I had uh, cancer. I was a police officer in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And uh, I definitely speak to Mr. some of Mr. Silverman's comments uh, about confiscation of money if a person was stopped and had excess cash on him, it was, it was taken, and sometimes it did not make it into the uh, evidence. Well, I know this firsthand. The problem I have with some of the contemporary law enforcement practices is here in Texas, there's been several incidents where people have filmed, uh, I guess what you could say is misconduct, and the police have taken the camera or, take, or just confiscated the camera or confiscated the, uh, and uh, I did have a problem with that, even though I was a police officer for many years. Wall and, Wallace, do, uh, do you do you feel that citizens have enough civil rights when it comes to interactions with the police? Um, yes and no. I think they don't assert their rights. Um, I've had many dealings with law enforcement since I retired, and I've never had a problem. But that doesn't mean the problems don't occur. When people are not aware of their rights or or just basically not aware of their rights. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Wallace. I, I appreciate that. And I think that's it's, it's an important message to pass on. I mean, I get lots of calls and, and emails from parents, um, you know, in, including, uh, you know, uh, black ministers recently, you know, in the wake of Ferguson, who they crave this information, you know, now so more than ever because, they just want their, 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 their sons and daughters to come home safely. And there's a, there's a time in every parent, you know, once their, 
Their, their, their kids turn about 16 years old and they're driving where suddenly for, that, for, the, for, the, for the young emerging adult, suddenly the officer friendly isn't necessarily going to be as friendly when they're pulled over. And they have that moment where they like realize, wait a second, this person might not be looking out for me and they're interrogating me and presuming that I'm guilty and they're asking me to consent to searches. And I think that that's a problem and that should be something that, that police departments uh, should change. I, I think that people should continue to feel that sense that they are engaging with someone who is like an officer friendly, who's actually there to protect and serve rather than to try to shake them down. Steve Silverman, you pointed out the uh, Prince George's County Police as a not such a good example in your view. Uh, is there a police department that is a good example? Of I believe um, the Seattle uh, police chief, I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but has been very, very positive in the way that um, he's interacted with citizens, including even Occupy protesters, you know, instead of bringing out MRAPs um, and bear cats and the like, has made sure that the, the uh, officers look like police officers should, their, their face is revealed, and made some interesting sort of comments saying, like, this mentality that police officers have, where their end goal is to avoid being hurt. And it's important you can appreciate that, and, but it, it oftentimes leads to this, this sort of absurdity where police will put themselves behind these, these protective walls and mine-resistant vehicles and dehumanize themselves. And that in itself creates more of an escalation. And so when police officers act like be police and they show their face and assume that, you know what, there could be uh, an increased level of risk to the police department, but that's something that police officers do. And he said essentially that you're not, to, the, to his police department, he said you're not being, you weren't drafted and that's something I understand that it's, it's easier for a police chief or a police officer to say to another police officer. I mean, like this, this, this guy hanging out here telling police officers that they should put themselves at greater risk. But that's part of, of the job, is assuming a certain level of risk. And to put yourself behind these walls and protective, you know, driving around in your car and not having the windows down or being on the beat actually isn't, any, making the community any safer, but is actually building walls that is actually making it harder to do good, engaged policing. Because if people don't trust the police, they're not going to work with police when they actually do need the police. And that's terribly disruptive. And according to the Officer Down Memorial page in 2013, 84 police were killed in the line of duty, 36 by gunfire. 19 by automobile accident, and you can see down the list, ve vehicular assault is another one struck by a vehicle. Um, but the 36 killed by gunfire, I mean, does that, is that a number that we should, we should give the police some slack here? Well, and say, hey, we are threatened out there. I don't really like to get into, into the game of how dangerous is police. In fact, policing is a somewhat dangerous job, but if you put it along a continuum of, of jobs that people have. It's not one necessarily one of even, I think, the top five. I mean, if you're looking at you know, lumberjack, cab driver, convenience store owner, these are all occupations that you're a lot more likely to um, be killed by violence. And so when police officers put up front, you know, saying, our job is so dangerous, therefore we need to have additional protective gear, we need to have mine resistant vehicles. It's almost always a play in order to justify expenditures that, that do not enable uh, for better face-to-face -face policing. And John in North Carolina tweets in, you had talked about one website, he says, record into Evernote, everything is in the cloud, best app ever. And our friend Evil Bastard says, my phone is set up so any photos or videos are automatically backed up to Google. Steve Silverman, Flex Your Rights is the organization, the website? FlexYourRights.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. We're going to turn our attention to some of the new mortgage rules that were announced by uh, Mel Watt, who's head of the Housing Authority here in Washington, D.C., former congressman from North Carolina. We're going to have the president and CEO of the Mortgage Bankers Association out here in just a minute.